pity that Charlene and I cannot do what we used to do 50 years ago with regard to gospel meetings in our area. 50 years ago, we could drive 15 miles west, uh, 18 miles south, 20 miles southeast, 18 miles north, go to a gospel meeting. Today, it is, I think it's a commentary on the, the condition of the churches today who have departed from the faith. I would say that Denton, North Point and Denton is the nearest congregation to us that we can go and support their gospel meeting today. And that's over 200 miles away. That's a sad commentary on the church. And I, I know that you all probably are in basically the same situation. Uh, I'm so glad that Doug Post will be moving to Oklahoma. Uh, we're praying that he doesn't corrupt the state, <laughs> that we can maybe get a lot of the Yankee corruption out of him. But uh, Doug will be uh, uh, what we would call now our neighbor. He'll only be three hours east of us uh, near Muskogee. Muskogee is e in eastern Oklahoma. We're in far western Oklahoma. So, uh, But it will, it will be good to have him near us. And it's always good to go to North Point and visit with Dub. He he's treats Charlene really nice. Not, not me too well, but... Um, and, and I'm glad to see Dub here. I thought when I preached this at uh, North Point, I told him, I said, well, you all could sleep through this one. You know, you don't have to listen. I thought, well, Dub's probably just gone to take him a nap somewhere. Then I did see him come in. Uh, at least Philip and, and Janet and Charlene, are, they, they're here enduring it. <laughs> but uh, it is good to be here at this lectureship. You all have always been so very kind to us and there is nothing more wonderful than to be with good sound brethren who read the same book we do, who are like-minded and who stand for the truth like the brethren do at Bellevue and all of you brethren who are here. Uh, I love every one of you and uh, we are we are happy to be here with you. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for the nice things you've done for us and said. Thank you, ladies, for all the wonderful food. I know you are unsung heroes, but any lady who fixes me something to eat is my hero. And, and uh, you are my hero. Thank you so much. And probably... Uh, I think you would excuse me if I say my greatest joy being here this year is to see my brother Bernard. He is so dear to me. I love him so much. And I know he's anxious to get home. He won't be home till Friday. Pray for him. He will leave tomorrow. He will fly overnight and get to Nairobi the next night. Then he will spend the night there on Thursday night, and Friday he will drive to Indiwa, where he lives. And then on Monday he will start a gospel meeting at Komodo. So he's going to be very busy. Pray for him. I thought this was a, a rather unusual <laughs> topic till I got into it that Michael assigned me, the church and self-discipline. Well, then I got to thinking it really makes sense you think about it, Solomon wrote, he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. He's uh, rather sort of worthless if he doesn't rule himself. That's in Proverbs 25, 28. Self, the church and self-discipline. You know, you usually think, when you hear the word discipline, you usually think of the withdrawal of fellowship when you talk about discipline and the church. But the church withdrawing fellowship from somebody is never 
actually necessary when those who are members of the body of Christ practice biblical self-discipline or in they rule over their own spirit. You see, self-discipline actually is just self-control, according to the Bible. That's the meaning of the word temperance in the New Testament. Self-control or temperance is derived from the Greek word ekratia, meaning mastery of one's appetites and passions, power over oneself. And you know, that is the greatest obstacle that any person ever faces is himself, to control himself in the sense of persistence or restraint, or the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions. The word equitia would be listed as one of the described traits of an elder in Titus 1, 8, and 6. That's temperance or self-control. And that's one of the traits that an elder has to possess. It appears, uh, according to the source that I have, uh, in three instances in the New Testament, Acts 24, 25, Galatians 5, 23, and 2 Peter 1, 6. Actually, temperance is probably the more biblically accurate definition of the original intent of that word. So we're talking about self-control. I'm talking about Jerry Brewer controlling himself and Doug Post controlling his appetite, or himself, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he could say, physician, heal thyself. Of that kind of control, self-control, Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth a prize, so run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He's talking about those who compete in the Olympic Games, the physical uh, athletic contests. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The crown that we're striving for is the crown of glory, incorruptible, after a while. So Paul said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Who wrote that? The Apostle Paul. Well, as you know, uh, there is such a thing as perseverance of the saints, and, and once you become a Christian, you can't ever be lost. But Paul, the Apostle, says that doctrine is a lie. He says, I have to watch myself. Here's an inspired man, an apostle of the Lord, through whom the truth is being or was revealed, and he says, I have to keep under my body, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means after I have preached to others, I might be a castaway. I might be lost. So if Paul has to be that careful with his body, I think we need to be at least that careful with our bodies. Self-discipline. Self-discipline begins, here's where it begins with regard to, to Christianity. Self-discipline begins with a decision to follow Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. If you do not discipline yourself, deny yourself, you can't follow Jesus. He said that, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. 
I want to come to Jesus. Well, the first thing you have to do is deny yourself. I want to come to Jesus and join the church of my choice. You're not denying yourself. Why don't you come to Jesus and be a member of the church of his choice? Well, I want to come to Jesus, but uh, I want to keep drinking. I want to keep drinking alcohol. I, I like to gamble. Uh, I like that sort of thing. But I want to come to Jesus. Well, you can't do that. You have to deny yourself. You're wanting to come to Jesus on your own terms. You cannot come to Jesus on your own terms. Deny yourself. That's the very first step in becoming a Christian is self-denial. Now, you know denominations, and, and you've heard them, and I hear them, and they're on TV, and we, we hear them everywhere. They say, come just as you are. You don't have to get rid of anything. In fact, in fact, there, I saw one on YouTube that says you can come to Jesus just as you are. Don't worry about your sins. You don't have to get rid of any sins. Just come as you are. That doesn't sound like what Jesus said. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. To deny oneself is self-discipline. And one who is unwilling to place the Lord before himself cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ. To cultivate or to deny oneself is to cultivate the traits of those whom Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That was so stated in Matthew chapter 4 toward the end, where he said he was preaching, preached the gospel of the kingdom. And within that context comes the Sermon on the Mount. It is the gospel of the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is not a uh, list of uh, nice, nice little maxims and rules by which we should live. It is a description of the characteristics of those who would, who would compose the kingdom as it was to be established on Pentecost. And Brother Wallace called the Sermon on the Mount, and particularly the Beatitudes, Pentecost pointers. They pointed to Pentecost. Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, here is the kind of people who will be my disciples. And uh, in Brother Wallace's, in his book, The Sermon on the Mount and the Civil State, he, he made these comments on Matthew 5, 3, where Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, a lot of people take that and they say, Oh, blessed are the poor people. God will bless them and they'll be God's children. They're just poor people. Well, listen to what Brother Wallace wrote about that. Quote, the word poor is usually descriptive of what a man has or does not have, but the expression poor in spirit refers to what a man is. It carries the idea of dependence on something other than one's own self. Jeremiah declared, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. The one who is poor in spirit depends upon God for direction, and that will lead him into the kingdom. It is the opposite of the command of the world's resources which breeds the independence of self-sufficiency and human wisdom. The kingdom of heaven, which had been announced, was a sphere of divine grace which only the obedient spirit could enter. And the phrase, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, are words which pointed 
to Pentecost when the kingdom that was drawing nigh was established. A prophetic description of the character of its constituents is set forth in Isaiah, or in the metaphors of Isaiah 35, verses 8 through 10. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. The wayfaring men are men who fare by the way and are not acquainted with the territory through which they are passing, and they must be guided. The fools of the passage, the wayfaring men, though fools, the fools of the passage are not simpletons, but are descriptive of men who realize the need of guidance and know they cannot guide themselves. It's on pages 12 and 13 in the Sermon on the Mount by Foy Wallace, Jr. The poor in spirit. The poor in this world's goods who lack the, the material necessities of life are dependent upon others for those things. Well, the same is true with those who desire salvation. You see, and this is what all men should recognize, is that all of us are poor in spirit. We cannot provide for ourselves. Adam and Eve found that out in the Garden of Eden when they made fig leaves. They could not cover themselves properly and God used animal skins to clothe them. Man tried his own way. Throughout the scriptures you see where men try their own ways and it just doesn't work. Nadab and Abihu thought they could offer incense which God had not commanded them. It did not work. Paul says that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Man cannot direct his own steps. Sarah thought she could help God when she told uh, Abraham to take her handmaid, Hagar, and have a child by her. She wanted to help God out. But it didn't work. Man cannot direct his own steps. He can't figure out a way to please God. He can only know how to please God by revelation. And so, first of all, if he is to please God, he must recognize that he is spiritually poor, utterly bereft of the means to save himself. The recognition of that fact and the determination to deny himself, forget about his own ideas, is the beginning of salvation. That's the beginning of salvation, to deny oneself. The key to self-discipline in the church is what Paul said when he said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. There's the key to self-discipline. Now, we're not talking about the discipline exercised by the church, although the church must, in many instances, exercise discipline. But we're talking about self-discipline. My discipline of myself within the church as a Christian. Self-discipline begins if denying oneself, disciplining oneself is the beginning of salvation. Self-discipline begins in the inner man or the spirit. Because that's where all decisions begin, whether to serve God or whether to serve Satan. They all begin within the spirit, the inner man, the heart. This body may be used to commit sin, but the body itself, this fleshly body, is neither good nor evil. It's neutral. What makes it 
Evil is what the inner man determines to do with it. The body is the instrument by which man commits sin. The inner man must make the decision whether to serve God or Satan. The inner man controls all of the actions of both the alien sinner and the Christian. And those actions are expressed through the body. Here's what Brother Whiteside, R.L. Whiteside, wrote in his uh, commentary on uh, Romans, which I think is the definitive work on Romans. He said, obedience is from the heart. The spirit expresses itself through the body. Hence, we are commanded to present our members as instruments of righteousness unto God and so also does the spirit sin through the instrumentality of the body though committed through the instrumentality of the body sin comes from the heart and then he quotes Mark 7 21 through 23 for from within out of the heart of men Evil thoughts proceed, fornication, thefts, murders, adulteries, covetings, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye railing, pride, foolishness, all these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. And that's on page 136 of his commentary on Romans. The man who rules over his spirit is self-disciplined, and he makes his body either a servant of righteousness or a servant of sin. The key here is his own spirit. See, you can't rule my spirit. I can't rule your spirit. Each must rule his own spirit. That's the key. The spirit, the inner man. It is that which is converted to Jesus Christ by being born again, according to John 3, 5 through 8. And it is the spirit of man which controls all of his actions. When a man is converted to Jesus Christ, when he uh, believes in the Lord, repents of his sin, confesses his faith, and is baptized into Christ, having his sins remitted thereby, and raised to walk from that watery grave into a newness of life, he still looks the same. He still looks the same. I could use Michael Hatcher for an example. If Michael weren't a Christian today and I converted him and baptized him into Christ, as soon as he was baptized into Christ, he'd be just as ugly as he is right now. It wouldn't change a thing as far as his looks. But he'd be beautiful inside because he'd be a Christian. You see, it's the inner man that is not, uh, that is, that is changed. The outward man, and, and Michael, I was as ugly after I became a Christian too on the outside. I just want you to know that. <laughs> the outward man doesn't change. It didn't change our looks. Oh, he's just got a glow about it. He just, you, may, you may smile a lot and be happy, but it doesn't change your looks. The change is the inner man. It's the soul. In his comments on Romans 6.12, Brother Whiteside wrote these words. He said, Paul addresses that part of man which has the control of the body and which is therefore responsible for what the body does. The body is a mere instrument to be used by the inner man, the spirit, for good or bad. The spirit is charged to not let sin control the body. God gave the human being certain appetites and passions for his own preservation and for the perpetuity of the human race, but the purpose to hold them in check or the plans to gratify them, either in a lawful or unlawful way, are formed in the heart. Your body is an instrument of righteousness, or it's an instrument of sin. 
And that determination is made by your inner man, by the spirit, by the heart, by the soul. Self-denial in becoming a Christian must continue in every Christian's life if the church is to function properly. Now here come together the ideas of the church and self-discipline. Self-denial in becoming a Christian must continue in every Christian's life if the church is to function properly. No entity is stronger or healthier than its constituent components. A chain is no stronger than its weakest link. It's an old saying, and it's a worn-out old saying, but it's still as true today as the day it was first said. The human body is composed of individual cells. Our physical bodies are composed of cells, very small units. And when any cell fails to function, the body suffers. So it is with the church. You see, the church is composed of individuals. Peter said, Ye also, as lively or living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 5. We are the components, the spiritual components, spiritual stones, living stones. That's what he says. We're not just dead, inert stones. We are living stones who make up the body of Jesus Christ or the church. Now, any stone, living stone in the church or any priest in the church, any priest, you're a living stone, you are a holy priesthood. Any living stone or any priest within the church that is weakened or spiritually sick adversely affects the entire body. That's true with the human body as well. You let cells become diseased in your human body and it affects the whole body. And so it is spiritually speaking. In fact, that was demonstrated in Israel. If you remember in the uh, 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 book of Joshua, Joshua the seventh chapter, when Israel took Jericho and God had said, he gave them instructions how they were to take that city and they followed his instructions to the letter and the walls fell down. But actually, God did it. Now, he wouldn't have done it if they hadn't followed his orders. Here, the fall of Jericho is a classic example in the scriptures of the grace of God. The grace of God was not grace only at Jericho. God told Joshua, I have given into thine hands the city of Jericho. Did you hear that? That was past tense. I have given. It was one week before the walls of Jericho fell. I have given. When God says something, it's as good as done. When he does something, it's as good as done. I have given. It's there. I've given it to you. Now here's what you have to do. For the next week, you've got to walk, march around the wall of the city once a day for six days. And on the seventh day, march around seven times, blow the trumpet. People shout. Walls fall down. And that's exactly what happened. But God said, you're not to take anything out of there. And you know why? Because actually, they did nothing of their own accord as far as taking the city. God gave them that city. And so God said, this is all my spoils. You don't take anything. Achan took some uh, valuable items, including a Babylonish garment. They went up against the city of Ai in their next battle, and nobody knew that uh, Achan had taken those things. When they went against Ai, the men of Ai routed the Israelites, and Joshua couldn't figure that out. What's wrong, Lord? 
What's the matter? He fell down before the Lord and God said, you've got sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. What is it? Well, God, through a process, he pointed out who had sinned and what he'd done. It was Achan. He had taken some spoils from Jericho and he and his house were destroyed. Then Israel was healed. There was no longer sin in the camp and they were able to defeat their enemies. Brethren, the same is true with the church today. As long as we tolerate sin in the church, tolerate sin in the individual, we are tolerating it in the church. I know a church in Elk City, Oklahoma that uh, uh, I've known that church for more than 70 years. And I do not recall in all of those 70 years them ever disciplining a member, although I have known many of their members who were drunks. But they didn't discipline anybody. Don't even know if they were talked to. Uh, certainly, uh, they, they, uh, many of them didn't repent. The church must practice discipline or it can never prosper. As long as it tolerates sin in the camp. Ours is an age of individual irresponsibility. Individual irresponsibility, which accounts for a lot of the weakness and the apostasy that is rampant in the church today. The idea that members of the church can corporately fulfill their personal individual obligations to the Lord is irresponsible and it is manifested in a proliferation of unscriptural organizations to do the work that individuals should do and that the local church should do and I'll give you an example churches of Christ disaster relief effort brethren over in uh, Timbuktu or in Podunk Oklahoma think they can send them ten dollars and say I've done the work of the Lord that's it. Buying my way into heaven. You see, with a lot of members of the church, individuals, they think money is the key to everything. Well, we live in a society that believes that. Money is everything. You know why we pass laws in Oklahoma, and probably you do in the states where you live, they'll say, well, we need a law here because this is costing the state X amount of dollars. And, you know, we need to do away with the death penalty because to put a man in prison and to execute him costs X amount of dollars. God still says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. But, but money has become the be-all and end-all of, of our society and especially, uh, 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 sadly to say, among members of the church. For many people, Christ, uh, Christians, for many Christians, money is the means of doing the Lord's church. It's easier to expend a few dollars to some so-called cause than to spend some time and energy to attend to the needs of others that individual Christians ought to do. Well, the Christian parents... Let me, let me make a public statement here, not only to this group here, but across the world on the internet. Any church that has a youth minister or a youth and family minister is not a church of Christ. Now, there may be what they call mainstream churches of Christ but they're hiring somebody to raise their kids. The Bible says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. But now, so many brethren in the church think, well, we're going to hire, we're going to hire little uh, Junior Jones 
right out of school as our youth minister because the kids love him. He's one of them. Be like me letting my oldest son raise the rest of my kids. Parents shirk their individual responsibilities. Youth director. In some churches, uh, elders shirk their responsibilities by delegating those to the preacher. Elders in many places think that they are a board of directors or like a school board, they'll make the policies and the preacher is a superintendent to do the hiring and firing and the running of the church. That's the way a lot of, that's the way a lot of people look at the relationship between preachers and elders. Elders just, they're just sort of figureheads. They're board members. No, they're shepherds. They're overseers. That's what the Bible says. Elders are charged with overseeing the church. They've created a denominational pastor system within the church by not doing their duty as elders. Paul's told the Ephesian elders, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing so grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. The elders are shepherds and they are to shepherd the church. The word feed, feed the church of God should be translated shepherd the church of God. It involves a lot more than providing food to the sheep. The shepherd was a constant companion of his sheep. He protected them. He watched over them day and night and protected them from uh, uh, wild animals that would uh, tear and rend them, would decimate the flock. That's why the church is in such a mess today in so many places is because elders have never shepherded the church. And I want to explain that the most important part, I believe, of an elder's work is to watch out for false teachers. You let a false teacher get into the church, you don't stop him, he will destroy the entire flock. You let a wild... You let a coyote into your sheep flock, and he will, the coyotes will destroy the sheep. Christianity begins and ends with the individual. So then, every one of us should give account of himself to Christ or to God. Romans 14, 12. I can't obey the gospel for my children or my parents. They can't obey the gospel for me. Self-discipline is not the responsibility of the elders, Bible class teachers, or the preacher. As self-discipline in the church begins at conversion, it, it, it continues in spiritual growth. The cells of our physical body remain healthy and function properly when we take care of them by providing them proper nourishment and exercise. The individual Christian is that spiritual cell in the body of Christ, and in order for that spiritual body to function as it should, the Christian must discipline himself by ordering his life according to the scriptures. Everything that we need is found in the scriptures. To keep the church, church healthy, I have to keep me healthy spiritually. You have to keep you healthy spiritually. And when we do those things, a refusal to practice self-discipline begins in the heart. And that refusal to practice it, beginning in the heart, ends with a full withdrawal of fellowship by the church. A public recognition and a declaration that this impenitent one who did not discipline himself is not walking according to the scripture, not walking in the light. But brethren, the other side of that coin is this. When self-discipline is practiced by every member of the church, that final action by the church is never necessary. So, 
that the church may not be charged with exercising discipline against us, let each of us discipline himself. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, and the way he put it, that when we discipline ourselves, church corrective discipline is never necessary. He was talking about uh, elders turning over their responsibility or delegating it to their personal responsibilities to the preacher. I was at a place, and this will identify it fairly easily, but uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, the day that Karen and I got married, I got a telephone call, and uh, this uh, person wanted to talk to me. Okay, so I met with them that day, and they wanted to tell me two things, basically. The first is that I did not love Karen and should not be marrying her. That was very nice of them, but uh, the second is that, uh, the way they put it, I was a good preacher, but they needed someone there that would run the church. So, uh, they needed me gone because I didn't do that. Um, I thought that the Bible still taught that elders were to do that and that congregation had elders. But that's the thinking of a lot of brethren. Uh, and that's what a lot of elderships have done through the years. They've just let the preacher do it instead of exercising the authority that God has given them to do that work. We appreciate that lesson. Uh, we'll be dismissed now.